My name is Jessica Kinsaitis, and I'm the community ambassador here at InSpirit Church. For those of you who don't know, I've worked here the past couple of years. I'm seeking my master's degree and probably getting ahead of myself, having visions of graduation. That's a long ways off still, but I can look forward to something. Also expecting our third baby to arrive in May and uh, about 15 weeks, but I'm not counting down. And we have two little girls at home. I'm married to Mr. Wonderful, who loves and supports us so well. And our life is full and rich and super demanding, but I'm not sure I would have it any other way. So thank you again for having me up here to deliver God's word to you. It's a pleasure, and it's honestly a privilege. So thank you. This morning you'll notice that I, I titled the sermon, God's Blessing on the Family, and that's because this morning we're going to look at exactly that. We're going to look at what God means when he says that he's going to bless our family, and he's going to raise us to great people to be a witness for him. And I think what he means by that is your family is your mission field. Your family is your mission field. And why are we looking at this? It's because we're in the first week of our family series. I'm starting off and kicking off the family series. We like to come back to this each year and we revisit this, this concept of families. And I think that God tells us pretty specifically in his word that your family is your mission field. This morning I'm going to preach to you out of the Old Testament and stay with me because I think sometimes preaching directly out of the Old Testament can look a little bit like you're just listening to all these laws and rules and commands and precepts and statutes that God is telling you and you have to follow them, right? And if you don't, then it's followed up with God's wrath. And how much easier would it be if I just settled in the New Testament and got that feel good, right? Like more love, grace, and maybe you even find Jesus' love and grace a little bit more prominently. I'm not telling you it's not in the Old Testament, but do you, do you see the difference there? But this morning what I want to look at is Deuteronomy 4, 1 to 40. And what I want you guys to get out of this, if you get nothing out of the next time that we're here together this morning, understand how deep the covenant is between God and Israel and God in us. Your family is your mission field. Now, I'm not going to go over everything in Deuteronomy 1 to 40 because I think Deuteronomy 4 kind of has its own way of fitting into Deuteronomy as a whole. It kind of has its fancy footwork in Deuteronomy 4 because I'll, I'll get to that later. <laughs> not only will you, will you notice that Israel in Deuteronomy is being challenged to obedience because of prior rebellion, but God's saying, you're being promised this covenant blessing because of your obedience and your faithfulness. God doesn't give us all these laws and rules and commands and statutes because he thinks it's fun to put limitations on us or to put boundaries on us. The reason he does it is because of his character, his gracious character, and the way that he reflects this in Deuteronomy 4 is on the family. God calls us to obedience so that we can pass on this faith to our children and reflect God's character to the world. Are you guys seeing the pattern already? Right? Your family, your family is your mission field. So before I give it all away, and yes, this is 40 verses, but stick with me. And yes, I tried to take some out, but I just couldn't because I think it takes away from the richness so we're going to read 40 verses, and it's really good. So turn with me in your Bibles, whether you're online or you're in the building with us this morning. I'm going to read from Deuteronomy 4, 1 to 40, and I'm reading from the NLT. 
And now, Israel, listen carefully to these decrees and regulations that I am about to teach you. Obey them so that you may live, so you may enter and occupy the land the Lord your God of your ancestors is giving you. Do not add or subtract from these commandments I am giving you. Just obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you. You saw for yourself what the Lord did at, to you at Baal Peor, Peor. There the Lord your God destroyed everyone who had worshipped Baal, the God of Peor. But all of you who are faithful to the Lord your God are still alive today. Every one of you. Look, I now teach you these decrees and regulations just as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may obey them in the land that you are about to enter. The promised land, right? You're about to enter and occupy. Obey them completely, and you will display your wisdom and intelligence among the nations. When they hear all these decrees, they will exclaim, How wise and prudent are the people of, the great, of this great nation! For what great nation has a God as near to them as the Lord our God is near to us whenever we call on him? And what great nation has decrees and regulations as righteous and fair as this body of instructions that I'm giving you today? But watch out, he says. Be careful. Never forget what you yourself have seen. Don't let these memories escape from your mind as long as you live. And be sure, be sure to pass them on to your children and your grandchildren. Never forget the day when you stood before the Lord your God at Mount Sinai, where he told me, Summon the people before me, and I will personally instruct them. Then they will learn to fear me as long as they live, and they will teach their children to fear me also. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, while flames from the mountain shot into the sky. The mountain was shrouded in black clouds and deep darkness, and the Lord spoke to you from the heart of the fire. You heard his words but didn't see his form. There was only a voice. He proclaimed his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to keep, and which he wrote on two stone tablets. It was at that time that the Lord commanded me to teach you his decrees and regulations, so that you would obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy. But be very careful. You did not see the Lord's form on the day he spoke to you from the heart of the fire at Mount Sinai. So do not corrupt yourselves by making an idol in any form, whether of man or a woman, an animal on the ground or a bird in the sky. A small animal that scurries along the ground or a fish in the deepest sea. And when you look up into the sky and see the sun, moon, and stars and all the forces of heaven, don't be seduced into worshiping them. The Lord your God gave them to all the peoples of the earth. Remember that the Lord rescued you from the iron smelting furnace of Egypt to make you his very own people and his very own special possession which is what you are today. But the Lord was angry with me because of you. He vowed that I would not cross the Jordan and River into the good land the Lord your God has given you as, a, as your special possession. You will cross the Jordan to occupy the land, but I will not. Instead, I will die here on the east side of the river. So be careful not to break the covenant the Lord your God has made with you. Do not make idols of any shape or form, for the Lord your God has forbidden this. The Lord your God is a devouring fire. He is a jealous God. In the future, when you have children and grandchildren and have lived in the land a long time, do not corrupt yourselves by making an idol of any kind. This is evil in the sight of the Lord your God and will arouse his anger. Today I call on heaven and earth as witnesses against you. If you break my covenant, you will quickly disappear from the land you are crossing the Jordan to occupy. You will live there only a short time and then you will be utterly destroyed. For the Lord will scatter you among the nations, where only a few of you will survive. There, in a foreign land, you will worship idols made from wood and stone, gods that neither see nor hear, nor eat nor smell. But from there you will search again for the Lord your God. And if you search for him with all your heart and your soul, you will find him. In the distant future, when you are suffering all these things, you will finally return to the Lord your God and listen to what he tells you. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon you or destroy you or forget the solemn covenant he made with you and your ancestors. Now search all of history from the time God repeated people on earth until now and search from the one end of the heavens to the other. Has anything as great as this ever been seen or heard before? 
Has any nation ever heard the voice of God speaking from fire as you did and survived? Has any other God dared to take a nation for himself out of any other nation by means of trial, miraculous signs, wonders, war, and had a strong hand and a powerful arm and terrifying acts? Yet this is what the Lord your God did for you in Egypt right before your eyes. He showed you these things so you would know that the Lord is God and there is no other. He let you hear his voice from heaven so he could instruct you. He let you see his great fire here on earth so he could speak to you. Because he loved your ancestors, he chose to bless their descendants. And he personally brought you out of Egypt with great display of power. He drove out nations far greater than you so he could bring you in and give you their land as a special possession as it is today. So remember this. So remember this. And keep it firmly in mind. The Lord is God, both in heaven and on earth, and there is no other. If you obey all the decrees and commands I am giving you today, all will be well with you and your children and your children's children and the generations to come, right? I am giving you these instructions so that you will enjoy a long life in the land the Lord your God is giving you for all time. Thanks for bearing with me. We're going to unpack this in four main questions. And the first is this. What does God want us to do? That's a, that's a big, long chunk of scripture. And the question is, what does God want us to do with this? God wanted to make Israel a great nation. And he wanted to use them as a witness and he wanted them to go and reflect God's character to the world. And because of their faithfulness and their obedience, but Moses warned them, and the words that he said was, take heed, take heed, right? Moses said, take heed, meaning listen, focus, pay attention, listen to your father, right? I would assume we want to listen to the expert first. Center yourself on God the Father, and then teach it to your children, and then have your children teach it to their children, and pass it on to the generations to come. But he does this with some type of urgency in Deuteronomy 4, and when God does that, I love, I, I personally love, and I'm sure some of you do too, finding the repetition in scripture, and I think God so often does it in scripture, he continuously repeats himself, and he does it again in Deuteronomy 4, and I want to point that out for you, how he does that, because I think he's doing it with a sense of urgency. He's saying, please get this. When he repeats himself, I think it's largely saying, don't miss this. Grasp this. And I, I want to make, I think it's a little bit clearer in the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases it. And he says it three times. He says, he says be alert. Check it out. Deuteronomy 4 9 in the message, it says, just make sure you stay alert. Keep close watch over yourselves. Don't forget anything of what you've seen. Don't let your heart wander off. Stay vigilant as long as you live. Teach what you've seen and heard to your children and to your grandchildren. And then skip down to 423. So stay alert. Don't for a minute forget the covenant with God, your God, that was made with you. And then at the very end of what we just read, 39 to 40, he said, now take it to heart right now. Like, okay, this is important. Take it to heart right now. God is in heaven above. God is on the earth below. He is the only God that there is. Obediently live by his rules and commands, which I am giving you today, so that you will live well, and your children after you, and your grandchildren, and the generations to come. Oh, and you'll live a long time in the land that God, your God, is giving you. Friends, the promise of a covenant blessing, what we're seeing here, is very dependent on putting our personal growth first and putting our personal growth in Jesus Christ as our priority. And maybe putting our, our little circle, right, our families first and making your family your battlefield. Your family is your mission field. 
So what is our motivation, right? That just seems like a really lot of laws to me. What's our motivation to this obedience and to this faithfulness? Obviously, it's that blessing will unfold. God told us that. But when we do, when we do, we become an advertisement to God. We become an advertisement to our children, and our children become an advertisement to their children, and then suddenly this faith and these words that we hold so dear in our heart are passed down in the generations to come. So the second is this. How should we do this? How do we do this? I've always had a hard time when I'm at conferences or church growing up or in general listening when it just says, do this, do this. But no one tells you how to do it. I get home and I'm like, I'm so defeated. I have no idea how to do what you just told me to do. The law, the law, right? The first five books of the Bible, the Torah, the law, is just an inspiration to us into action into moral law. You can't persuade someone by saying, obey the law, just listen, obey. We do it because we want to follow the God of Israel who was on a redemptive mission. We do it because we know that God. We have a personal relationship with that God. Those words are already on our hearts. And suddenly we have a change in heart. And we want to follow it. We want to be a witness to our children. So how do we pass this on? You'll notice that I'm going to touch on a few points from Joyner Newhoff book, and I meant to take that up here with me, and I didn't. But the book is titled Parenting Beyond Your Capacity. And in the back hallway here, we have a resource wall. And that book is there. You'll find that. So as I touch on these points, um, know that that resource is available to you. We have lots of great things for your kids here. We have children's worship and nursery, but we want to be more than that. We want to be a resource to parents, so feel free to check out that wall. There's lots of good stuff on that wall, but the first is this. Widen the circle. Widen the circle, meaning pursue strategic relationships for your kids. I think one of the benefits, one of the greatest values of a church body is an opportunity to spread your area of influence for your kids. One of the best benefits of getting involved in a life group is spreading your area of influence to your kids. Maybe it's volunteering at church. Yes, 2020 and 2021 look different, but the volunteering opportunities are still there. Whether you're on sound or hospitality or you a cleaning crew, You do it for yourself, but if you get your kids involved, you're expanding that level of influence. Your level of influence goes beyond your home. And you're creating a positive influence for your kids' lives. Imagine the end. Focus your priorities on what matters the most. Now, my confession here as I continue to, to give this to you is I'm humbled that I, that I can give this to you because we're such a young family ourselves, right? I think I'm a good mom and we think we're good parents, but we're young and we're still learning, so thank you for letting me give this to you. But imagine the end, right? Focus your priorities on what matters the most. Is it, is it wealth and stuff that you want to pass on to your kids? With the excess that's all around us right now, I think that it's really easy for comparison to happen parent to parent and even child to child. We begin to beat ourselves up and we say, wow, that parent could give their kid this. I'm never going to be able to give my kids that. You have that whole comparison bit. What you wouldn't do, and I find myself in this already, and with my kids as little as they are, in that moment, to just give your kids whatever it takes to just make them happy. Just be happy.
nothing is as important as what you leave in them. And what you pass down to them. And the words you impress on their hearts. So speaking of impressing words on their heart, you got to fight for the heart. Communicate with your kids in a way that gives the relationship value. So how do you do that? Well, I think fighting with someone is a little bit different than fighting for someone. I, too, am very guilty of thinking that my defiant three-year-old, I'm going to win because I'm the mom and we're in charge. I'm going I'm to win. I'm going to win, right? I'm going to fight you because the three-year-old is not the boss of me. <laughs> so I'm going to win. But how different does it look if I start fighting for my three-year-old? And I start giving that some type of value. If I'm fighting with her, I'm just in it to win it. I think that's a game, right? Minute to win it? Yeah, <laughs> whatever. You're in it to win it. You start fighting for your child, and you start adding value to that relationship. You start fighting for your child, and you start building a relationship, and walls start coming down, and you get to the root of it. This next one hit home for me with the stages that we're at with, with really little kids. And it's create a rhythm. What rhythms or, or patterns make up your home? I think by way of nature, we all fall into a pattern, right? We all, we all fall into a rhythm. You get up, you eat breakfast, you go to school, Maybe you go to work, then you come home, and you have dinner, and maybe you do homework, you watch a show, you go to bed. Okay, you have a pattern. And those patterns, whether you think it or not, begin to shape you. They begin to shape your home. They start to become your family's values. So I will ask again, what rhythms are making up your home? Do those rhythms need to be adjusted? What types of expectations are you setting on those rhythms? What type of un unmet expectations are you battling with? I know in our home we settle into a fair amount of rhythm. My husband and I are both pretty uh, ABC and checklist and organized and like I, a lot of my home is <laughs> very orderly and organized, and one might say it's a problem, okay? We settle into these rhythms, in these patterns. And our girls know at 7 o'clock each night, they get a bed snack, right? And somewhere from 7 to 8, we're going to get on our pajamas and we're going to watch a show, well, something that they like, right? A princess show. And then at 8 o'clock, they're going to go to bed. And Oftentimes, my husband and I, we tag team this, right? So we're putting them to bed, and the girls share a room right now because this baby needs space. And so they share a room, and they love that. So we're in there, and we're tucking them in, and we're turning out the lights, and we're reading them books, and we're, we're, we're putting dolls to bed, right? And then sometimes I find myself getting the dolls ready for bed, and when I'm getting the dolls ready for bed, my husband's finding the toys that the dolls can't sleep without, <laughs> and then <laughs> I give them a drink or three and we pray with them and we read them a Bible story and 20 minutes later we're allowed to walk out of the room and close the door and I get halfway down the hall and I hear hey mom and I think praise the Lord there's grace for today so I turn around and I go back into their room and before I open the door, I'm angry. And when I open the door, I see their sweet little faces. And I do it all over again. And I love them more than you will ever know. And I close the door, and I walk out. And I think, praise the Lord, there is grace for today. 
There is grace on motherhood. There is grace on parenting. There is grace on this little home out in the country that we're trying to build. And there's grace on your home too. So make it personal. Put yourself first when it comes to personal growth. Put yourself first when it comes to personal growth. Deuteronomy 6 has a lot to do with Deuteronomy 4. And it says, These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Moses didn't say it's supposed to be upon your family's hearts. He didn't say it's supposed to be upon your children's hearts. He said it's supposed to be upon your hearts. He said, put these words on your heart. And then after you do that, pass it on to your children. and the generations to come. Make yourself and your personal growth your priority. So number three, what is the result? What's the result of these 40 verses? Healthy families, healthy marriages, healthy kids, healthy generations to come. Scripture shows us this this deep longing that God has for people to reflect his character. Are they laws? Yes. Yes, they are. They're laws and they're commandments. But I think more than that, what we miss is that they're wonderful laws. These are like an opportunity in front of us to obey. And people notice. People notice when we follow them. People are like, wow, they really have a healthy marriage. Wow, they really have happy kids. Wow, they're really happy people. What do they have that I don't have? And in Deuteronomy 4, we start to see that, right? Other nations wanted in on that. They wanted what, what Israel had, and they couldn't put their finger on it. They're like, what do they have that I don't? And you start to see that other nations wanted in on it. People aren't around us are going to want what we have, yes, but we can't give something away that we don't have. We can't be a a witness to Christ in some sense if you're not living within some type of moral law. So let's wrap this up. Why do we do this? Friends, we do it all in response to God's grace. Do we do it all by sheer willpower? No. God keeps pointing us back to him back to the story of salvation, and back to the cross. With enough grace to keep coming back, and coming back, and coming back. Prior to Deuteronomy 4, we see in Exodus 19, and I didn't put this in the slides because poor Kara changed my slides like five times this week. If you see her, just thank her for what she does because PowerPoint is not my gift. This is my gift, not PowerPoint. And she changed it for me. So I'll have you reference Exodus 19 on your own, but if you'll notice in Exodus 19, they focus very much on the nations. And when you, then you get into Deuteronomy and they focus on the children. It's largely being a witness to the nations and then being a witness to the children. God's call for our response of obedience is motivated by the experience of God's saving grace and the work that Jesus did at the cross. Deuteronomy, the Old Testament as a whole, are vastly witnessing to God's saving grace and the redemption of the Israelites in leading them out of exile. I have to believe that part of God's grace on Israel was how he took care of them in exile. Not once, not once, all those years they were in exile, not once do you read about how maybe their shoes wore out. You don't read about how maybe they ran out of food. You don't read about how maybe God left them. But what you do read about is them coming to repentance and God in his mercy and grace delivering them. And then raising them to this great nation to be a witness of his character. So we bring it all home and God says only hope and grace remains. 4.29 says, For there you will search again for the Lord your God, 
And if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul, you're going to find him. And we fast forward to Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7. It's the great commandment. The whole law hinges on this commandment, and it says you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Do this. Be blessed. Live long and well and be my witness. So as we draw to a close, we ask ourselves, why do we do these things? Because we simply have a deep, deep love for the Father. So as you go into your week, I pray that you're challenged to be faithful, to be obedient agents of God's love in a broken world. It's all around us right now. We have a ton of questions right now. But hold his words in your heart and pass those on to your children and make others wonder what you got so that we can continuously reflect Christ to this world and to those around us. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your words. We thank you for continuously showing us your grace as we seek to know you and better and to seek to hold your words in our hearts. May we be faithful and obedient agents of your love as we seek to pass on our faith to the next generation. Lord, we continuously be a reflection of your character to the world. Even in a broken world, God, would you keep us reflecting who you are and keep your words on our hearts. In your name, amen.